thank you for having me. You're welcome. I feel younger, just like you said. Uh, age is a number. And uh, we ensure that we don't allow the number reflect in our activity. We allow our mentality to take the lead. So I feel younger. Like Caleb said, you know, he said, as I was 40 years ago, so I feel right now. Though he was eight years old when he spoke that. So the scripture is our pattern for living. Um, the journey has been as expected because you expect trials and then you expect triumph. You expect the good, you equally expect the bad. You expect loyalty and faithfulness, you expect betrayal. But like scripture said, all things work together for good. So it has truly all worked for my good. Uh, that's a very good question. Um, I didn't choose this path, I was choosing. I only grew up to discover that I was predestined to be a preacher. So for me, it was a discovery, not a choice. And having discovered that I was destined to be a preacher, I committed myself to what was required to be effective in that which I was choosing to do. So I do the best I can to remain relevant, not to reign, just being relevant. And God has been faithful these three decades. The, the, the gospel or the ministry is not like the secular system. Ministry usually is a function of predestination. Men only ordain, but you were predestined. So what you were called to do before you were born, you can't retire while you are alive because it preceded your birth. So there are no younger preachers. That is a deception. There are only preachers who are of a younger age. So, to answer your question, there are no upcoming generation. That classification is not relevant in the realms of the spirit because out of the mouth of babes and suckling, God ordains strength. So, anybody can be called today. You think he's young, he's not young. The spirit in him is an ancient spirit. So, there's no retirement as it were because this calling predate, pre, pre, predate your birth. Now, like you did mention of one of the giants who retired of recent, he only retired from a denomination, not ministry. Because he was in ministry before he joined the denomination. So denomination has their rules and regulations, but not ministry. It's a calling, an internal one for that matter. Wow. Um, I would have loved not to mention my regrets here, but for the purpose of lessons to be learned. My regrets were the activities in my youthfulness. I allowed youthful exuberance played more role in my activities as a young man. So having grown up now, looking back in retrospect, I realize that to a very large extent, perception is stronger than reality, where ministry is concerned. So there were things I said, oh, who cares? My heart is right. Whatever they want to think, let them think. Only to realize that how people think is very important. Regardless of how sincere you are, men look at the outward appearance. These were things we didn't consider growing up. For example, just very practical example, as a young man, I could carry 10 ladies in the car, I'm taking them to church in my heart, I'm giving them a lift. Now, a passerby sees those people in the car and assume this young man must be a flirt. Only him with six sisters. So now as a matured minister, not even my biological sister do I give a lift. Because I realize perception to a normal man is stronger than your reality. Um, I won't say I'm a fulfilled man at 50. I am fulfilling purpose. Um, the classification to me makes no meaning because from the first day I entered ministry, I dedicated the totality of my life, regardless of how long I live, to the purpose and to the vision 
that the Lord has given to me, which is primarily the edification of people's spirit, the empowerment of their mind, the healing of their body. So my entire ministry is centered around these three. The church is for the spiritual edification. Everywhere I've gone to do ministry, we have built a school. Like in Gombe, we have a school to about primary level, nursery, creche, primary, secondary. Because I feel that we should inculcate the Bible into the syllabus so that people can truly think and reason the way God has created us to do. Then subsequently, we intend to own um, a hospital. Yeah, so that for those who still have lesser faith to be healed, can have modern technology medically attended to them. Um, every great man is a sum total of persons he experienced and encountered in the journey of life. So for me, basically, I won't say there's a single person because people inspire different aspects and dimensions of your life. There were those who inspired my prayer life. There were those who inspired my preaching life. There were those who inspired my character development. There were those who inspired my hunger for books and knowledge and information. And amazingly, there are others who inspired my dress sense. So I can't just mention one person and give credit to an individual why a body of people inspired different aspects of my life. For example, you know, um, uh, you are aware that Dr. Paul Nenche was here recently. It's one man that has inspired my restlessness. Like every time I think of resting on my horse, I, I can tell myself I've achieved something little. Then you look at the man pursuing greater things, having achieved great, 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 great things. And you tell yourself, if such a man is still restless, you have no reason to rest. So people, great men inspire different aspects of my life. And I'm grateful to every one of them, without exception. The Bible says, be ye followers of them who through faith and patience obtain. Now in followership, if you look at the fathers of faith as it were, Abraham is the grand patron of our faith work. And if the Bible encourages us to follow, then in followership of Abraham, like Jesus said, if ye be the seed of Abraham, do the works of Abraham. Abraham practiced all major dimensions of giving as we all believe today should be practiced. For example, um, offering began with Abraham. He built an altar and he offered to God. Tithing began with Abraham. He tithed to Melchizedek. Uh, we believe the high priest without beginning and end. That was, that epitomizes Jesus. Abraham practiced first fruit. The giving of Isaac was his first fruit. In fact, God categorically told him, your only son, your first son. Abraham practiced first fruit. Abraham practiced sacrifices. The Bible said in the Genesis 15, 13, and he built an altar and sacrificed different animals. So if you talk of sacrificial giving, you talk of tithing, you talk of first fruit, you talk of normal offering, Abraham, our father of faith, practiced it without the law. So uh, the problem we have right now with contradictory teachings are people who, for me, as a matter of fact, who just want to make a name by saying certain things that has been popular in an unpopular way just to be popular. Um, I don't know in what area you are talking about deviation, but if you are talking about Christianity and revival in Nigeria, I want to say to you that um, we have not let off our food from the throttle. Um, Nigeria has become the center from which God sends missionaries across the world. Everywhere you have been and gone, Nigerians are making impact. So if for me, it shows, it shows one truth, we have really grown. We have so grown that our churches are bigger. It's not usually the, the cliche uh, church rats. There are no church rats anymore. It's uh, elephants in the church. <laughs> This is beautiful. Um, actually, I started with the desire to just serve God and not to be a pastor. Um, when I got born again, I realized that I really, really love the things of God. So I got into the Assemblies of God Church, just 
passionately, passionately believe serving God, like passionately. And then I realized that as the days and years go by, my passion and desire to serve God was astronomically increasing. So I thought, because I really wanted to be rich, uh, let me confess. So I thought maybe God wanted me to be rich and then take off the burden of ministry. Sponsor pastors to Bible school, help widows, build churches. That was my desire. So, but when I got into a church in Bauchi 1995, Dr. Isaac Crown's church, Bishop Fred Addo came around and then in that meeting, he singled me out. Young man, the hand of God is upon your life. I came in from school for holidays then. And he said, give yourself to God and you'll be used. That awakened the consciousness of ministry in a different way I have always thought I was going to serve God. You know, so that, 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 that prophecy deepened my hunger for the word, deepened my hours in prayers, deepened my search for scriptures, and suddenly I found out that the willingness to always preach became stronger. So I would gather young men where I used to live in the barracks, created a fellowship, and I'll be preaching to them. And then from there we started going to schools, you know, to preach to students. Uh, there was this command day secondary school in, in the barracks in Bauchi. We just go to schools and preach. And in 1997, I was praying as my usual way of prayers at the beginning of every year, my fasting, and I got a revelation. That revelation I saw myself before a large crowd of people, and I woke up as if it was real. And I will never forget that day. The Spirit of God said to me, I want you to work for me full time, like it was very clear. I said, full time? I'm the first son of 18 children from a very poor family. My primary uh, desire to succeed was just to help my family. If I go into ministry, looking at Northern pastors, how do I shoulder the responsibility of a first son? How do I really break through in the way I really wanted? And so I, I, I'm, I'm a very practical person. So I said, God, prove to me that you can actually take care of me. So I went on a three days fasting. It was the first or third of July, 1997. I said, I just want you to prove to me that you can, you, can, you can bless me, you can prosper me if I choose to do ministry full time. As soon as I got done with that fasting, my good friend, Reverend Campbell Morrison in Mandu Kaduna, invited me for their conference. As a guest speaker, that was my very, very first conference as a guest speaker. So they paid my transport and I went to Kaduna for the first time. They are still alive today. It's Campbell Morrison. Um, and his brothers, Linus Midala, Reverend Linus Midala in Kaduna, Solomon Onoja in Bayelsa, we are all in that meeting. I preach from 7 p.m. to 10 a.m. non-stop. It was, the program was not meant to be an all night. Utterances, like re-utterances. And that was the first time God healed me of statutory tongues. I couldn't talk properly before. That preaching brought a dimension of eloquence I've never seen. The Lord told me, it means that I've touched your tongue. Then when that meeting ended, they gave me gift and money I couldn't expand for almost a year. For one year, I had enough money. For one year, I had enough clothes. Scambo Morrison is still alive. For one year, I had enough shoes. The gift they gave me from Kaduna, I almost had to charter a car to go take them back to Bauchi. I was in Bauchi then. It's interesting, right? Um, Apostle Paul Odola is the first son of Mr. Matthew and Madame Helene Odola. I hail from Otoli Aume in Ohumini, local government of Benue State. Uh, and I grew up in the barracks. My father moved from Boko 1976. Yes, a military nurse. Uh, we got to Gombe in 1976. I still remember vividly. I was quite young, but I still have the memory. And ever since, my life has been from one level to another until I encountered God, and here I am today. Amazingly, my relationship with Dr. Paul Lenencha has always been that of 
like a mentor in a way. When I was in Joss several years ago, and he used to attend the fellowship I was, as a very young doctor then, and I, I, I admire his ruggedness, his stylish holiness, unlike that of the other feet, which for me was repulsive in a way because I felt they were missing the good things of life. Dr. Paul had this rugged, holy approach to spiritual things that I admired so strongly. And ever since then, he has been for me like a, a mentor, more or less. And when I went to Bauchi to do fellowship, not ministry, fellowship, and at the VAD, which God told me to move to Gombe, I felt I needed somebody that could just come around and really bless me as a, a young minister and then really empowered the next move of ministry I wanted to do then. So uh, I invited him in 1995. I was just doing fellowship. I uh, didn't know I was going to be in, in full time then. But when I began to get this very strong leading, I said, let me get doctor to come around and just bless me, bless the young men I had around in the fellowship. And he came. In fact, let me say this to you. He's coming for me proved one very major truth that people can impact you in ways and manner that you start seeing practical manifestation of the hand of God upon your life. It was after his meeting in 1995, I started healing the, uh, the sick. It was after his meeting, I started doing deliverance. So that practical manifestation of faith for me gave me the confidence and audacity to really, really, really do God's work because when you hear such testimonies, it builds your faith. So when I came back to Abuja and I realized I was turning 50 and I needed to make major ministerial decisions, I felt that for a man that has been part and parcel of my life, who had been like a mentor, who inspired major aspect of my spirituality, I felt it was necessary to bring him to open me up to the next chapter of my life in ways and manner that will leave me with a memory to anchor the next phase. And it was a meeting we will not regret. That day till today, our membership jumped from the number we're counting to almost like 50, 100 percent. To be very practical, we're counting like 400. Now we're getting to about 800 plus. You could see that shift in a short while. And the church is just relatively young. We are just three years. We started DOPA in Gombe 1997. So if you're from 97 till now, if you, your maths is good, <laughs> 27, 28, yes, exactly. But in ministry, I've been in ministry for close to about 30 years. That's good. My advice for believers hearing me right now is the fact that the Bible should be the ultimate book by which they live their life and practice their faith. Number two, they should be followers of them who through faith and patience have obtained. Not eloquent, fluent preachers excited about revelations without substance and tangible proof for even what they teach. So they should be followers of them who through faith and patience have obtained. And we are blessed with such men here in Nigeria. I don't want to mention names so that nobody is left out, but be followers of them who through faith and patience. Number three, have a very personal, deep relationship with the Holy Spirit because he is the ultimate guide and teacher. With these three, you can't go wrong regardless of who wakes up tomorrow and turns the Bible upside down.